Wait a minute. This isn't my world. Disappointed! Welcome back to Thinking Critical. This is Wes. It's been an interesting week in comic books. A lot of um, not only just creators, but companies just throwing people under the bus, telling them to go F off and not the best example of customer service I've ever seen. And there's some hypocrisy going on here as well. And here with me to talk about that are my two. Normally, the two professors on Comic Writing 101, if you haven't checked that out on Sundays, you're crazy. But here to talk with me with, with these uh, these issues. First up, we've got Darkwing Duck writer Aaron Sparrow. How you doing? Doing fantastic. And next up, we have the man, well, the writer behind Common America, Mark Pell- Pellegrini. How you doing? I'm super. <laughs> super duper, so, guys. <laughs> super duper. Well, you're not going to be super <laughs> after you're done with this one. You're going to be pissed. So, I don't know. We, we talk from time to time about pro- professionals kind of going out of their way to be unprofessional to comic uh, comic book fans. And Neil Gaiman, of all people, decided to just kind of lash out at people as there was some feedback regarding the casting choices for the upcoming Sandman uh, show. I believe it's on Netflix. A lot of mocking ensued when they put that graphic out. They're including all their uh, pronouns and stuff like that. Just things that, that generally speaking, people are going to make fun of. But uh, I don't know, Aaron. It feels like like Gaben's kind of being, is he being hypocritical? Is he kind of straight up lying? There's quotes out there that, that indicate that possibly race swapping characters was, was not always what was meant to happen for these Sandman characters. In the past, Neil Gaiman has defended uh, the fandom saying that, you know, people want to see the thing that they know, you know, the thing that as it was presented, because there's a certain iconography that goes along with the characters. And so that's what people want to see and that you uh, you violated at your peril. Uh, But uh, that seems to have gone away uh, with a big fat Netflix check. He seems to have completely reversed course on his uh, on his previous convictions. Uh, So, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's an interesting uh, Interesting little thing we're going to dive into here. So this is his quote back in the day. He said, in death, her image will likely cement that particular version of death, the character, as the one most probably to be used in any future ad- adaptation in other medias. The fans, certainly the goss would be disappointed. Otherwise, Cinnamon was one of the nicest people I've ever known. Everyone took an immediate liking to her, speaking to, to about the person that the character of death was actually based off of. It just seems so disingenuous to me to have that statement out a couple of years ago. And I know that people can, can change and people can, people can grow, obviously, you know, the, the opinions and the convictions that you had, uh, you know, five, 10 years ago, don't necessarily reflect who you are today. But I I would think, especially when it is a character that is based off of a friend that you cherished, that you would not easily turn your back on the iconography of that character. And the fact of the matter is death is a, white skinned goth girl that is the uh that is the presentation that is all that has existed in the comics since sandman began it is a version that is beloved by sandman fans and to casually throw that aside i i think that you do that at your peril and then especially to then go full bore angry against the fans for daring to point that out when you wrote such a loving tribute to your friend who you based it on it just feels like you it feels like you sold out it, you know that's that's how it feels to me it's easy to have a lot of, you know, integrity and, and to stand by your principles until Netflix drops a giant sack of money on your doorstep and all of a sudden that goes out the window. I mean, Guyman's public response to the people criticizing the, uh, the, the race swapping of death, and this is his exact quote from Twitter, is, I give zero fucks about people who don't understand slash haven't read Sandman whining about a non-binary desire or that death isn't white enough. Watch the show, make up your minds. Now, that's fine if we didn't just have his previous quotes um, that Aaron um, just um, showed me and that you, you just read, where he stood by what death is supposed to look like because he based that appearance off of a friend of his who just passed away, whom he cared about. And now all of a sudden he's telling people to shut the hell up and that it doesn't matter what death looks like, what what death's appearance is. Um, like, you can't have it both ways, Neil. Like, did you base the character off of this actual friend of yours and her appearance means a lot to you because it's personal? Or does her appearance not matter and race is only, you know, a human concept and that she can be whatever color? It can't go both ways. But he's trying to play it that way because Netflix just threw a whole bunch of money at him and now he can't stand by whatever principle he once stood by before, um, which is trashy and, and lame and very disappointing. 
Wouldn't it have been better if he just admitted, like, listen, Netflix gave me a lot of money to adapt yeah. the material, and they're adapting it the way they want to. I didn't have input. I bet he's probably uh, signed his life away he to some sort of non-disclosure agreement. That? Yep, and now he can't. He can only say what the uh, corporate studio tells him he can say. He can only have the principles and integrity that they say that he can have, and he cannot say anything negative or critical of the deal because they threw a bunch of money at him, and he doesn't want to um, put that money in peril. Well, he probably still doesn't have to tell people to fuck off, Aaron. Like that right. feels like a bit of a stretch when people are making pretty valid criticism based on his own words. Well, I mean, Neil Gaiman has been. Uh, king shit of comics mountain for a long time so I, I assume that there's a certain amount of ego that goes along with that so to be you know he, he's not used to being challenged and so when he is challenged and he you know quite possibly knows that he's wrong and that he's backtracking on previous things that he said and that that's going to be pointed out uh, his ire is up uh, i mean that's just my interpretation of the situation i i could be wrong um, I think it's interesting, too, that he's conflating two separate issues. Uh, he's conflating, you know, people who, who don't understand, uh, you know, the work uh, is a reference to the people that are complaining that a non-binary, you know, somebody who proclaims to be non-binary is playing Desire, when Desire has always kind of been a non-binary character in the in the, uh, in the comics. That was, you know, always presented that way. So um, that, you know, people who don't know the comic who are complaining about that, yeah, I understand, you know, saying, hey, like, you guys don't know what you're talking about here. I think there's a more a more uh, polite way to go about it, a more, uh, you know, more customer service way to go about it and a way to get your point across that isn't uh, insulting and antagonistic. But, you know, that's uh, that's the path he's chosen. But he's conflating that with the people that are complaining about death, which is a separate issue entirely. Yes, Desire was always non-binary in the comics, was always kind of, you know, in between male and female and presented that way. But death was presented in a very specific way, too. This would be if, as if you presented desire and you just cast desire as a man who was the actor flavor of the moment, you know, and people were complaining about that. That would also be a valid complaint because that's not how the character is. So, you know, to go to, to try to conflate those two things, the appearance of death versus the, uh, the casting of, uh, of desire is a really disingenuous. And it's, it's kind of what people tend to do when they don't have an argument. They take the most extreme argument that exists on the one side and they use it to paint everybody who has an issue. Oh, you don't like Antifa? That must mean you're pro-fascist. That's the kind of level of argument that that is. Yeah, well, exactly. He, mm -hmm. he kind of went that route. Later on, uh, there are some people that were criticizing. What was, we talked about there's some valid criticism here. And then he, I guess one of them must have had Comics Gate or something in their Twitter bio or whatever. And then it was just like, none of this criticism was valid. Oh, if Comics Gate is into the room, as if if, if somebody that has comics gate or something in their bio just means their opinion or their criticism is, is, isn't valid or void at that point. But just complaining anybody that has that criticism must be that as well. It's the laziest thing. I just see so many uh, comic creators do this like, Oh, this is a comics gate issue. There are plenty of people that aren't comics gate. that have this exact same criticism, but they're just basically trying to pass the buck and say it's not valid anymore because there's a group I don't agree with. Agreed. It's a really lazy dodge, you know, it, it's um like, it's a, it's a uh, point and like, look over there kind of thing, you know. Now, Neil Gaiman, Gaiman, I, I always pronounced it Gaiman, but apparently it's pronounced Gaiman, so forgive me if I say Gaiman. Um, he's always been kind of up his own ass sorry but when you're um when you're considered a celebrity of your field um and you have just nothing but an echo chamber of people just worshiping you yes you tend to grow a big ego and to think highly of yourself now like back at, way back in the day this is a long time ago um i believe it was greg wiseman and um carrie bates wrote an issue of captain adam and i think this is way back in the, the 80s or the early 90s um, in which they included his death of the endless character. And in the story, the context of that story where Captain Adam is going through the stages of death and meeting the various, he was meeting the different incarnations of death across the DC universe, such as the black racer who uh, Jack Kirby created um, for the fourth world comics, who was the, uh, the, the new gods version of death. And then he also met um, death of the endless, who was the, uh, the vertigo incarnation of death, whom uh, Neil Gaiman created. That upset Neil Gaiman, and I know that a lot of people say that, that it was brought out of proportion that he that he didn't really get upset, quote unquote. But he did he did 
contact DC and said that he did not like that portrayal, that his version of death is the one and only death in the DC universe, and there are no other incarnations of death, including Jack Kirby's The Black Racer, and that his version of death is not to be um, uh, amended or changed. And that's why after following that, because Neil Gaiman had the celebrity pull to, to do and say those sorts of things to the editors, and he also, the editor at Vertigo loved him because he had a British accent, and I can't remember her name, but she loved British Burger. writers. Yeah, Burger. Um, so now everyone had to get Neil Gaiman's permission before that they or or approval before using death, even though he doesn't really have a legal ownership of the character, it was because of that. But it was always that that contradiction of Neil Gaiman, where it's okay for him to overwrite Jack Kirby and other writers on the concept of the personification of death in the DC universe, but don't you dare try to overwrite Neil Gaiman on the concept of death and his characters. That's not allowed. He always puts himself above other creators, including Jack Kirby. Um, so he's always kind of had that, that uh, king shit attitude. And this is nothing new uh, for Neil Gaiman. People just kind of memory hole the aspects of his character and personality that they don't want to acknowledge. I mean, you can kind of, you, just, just the way he kind of presents himself, he's, uh, he's kind of like the Ian Malcolm of comics, you know, that, uh, mm. oh, that rock star chaotician, you know, look at, oh, he's yeah. wearing all black. Oh, look, he's got a leather jacket. Oh, you know, uh, it's, it's kind of like the whole thing. <laughs> I told you about like, chaos you know, theory. Ooh. Yeah, oh, I, can definitely, yeah. Uh, I can definitely buy, buy this story. Or, you know, I definitely give some credence to this story that Mark just told. Wow, I'd never heard it before. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, I, you you know Greg, so you can probably ask him what it was like. But I mean, I so it's actually on a website called the um, the Greg Wiseman Archives, but it's uh, WMQComics.com. I was just reading it up for fact checking right now, but yeah, it was uh, um, Captain Adam number forty two through forty three from nineteen ninety that uh, Wiseman wrote with Bates that upset Gaiman because it's a. Uh, um, it changed uh, Death of the Endless's uh, role as the one true death in the entire universe to being an aspect of death, which upset Gaiman, um, apparently. So, yeah, next time you're talking to Wiseman, ask him about that, I guess. <laughs> that's crazy, but it's not just Neil Gaiman that's, that's apparently an asshole. Of, of late, Heavy Metal has gotten kind of become more than just a magazine. There's, there's a lot more comic books uh, coming out. And they, they changed the design of one of their characters that's been around for a long time. Uh, they decided to put some more clothes on or whatever. And people had some criticism like, hey, this is not how this character has been portrayed on comic book covers for a very long time, if ever. And they just started telling everyone to screw off, Aaron. And it's like, we don't want fans like you. What the? Is heavy metal selling enough comics to be talking to people like this? Uh, heavy metal. You mean he the same heavy metal that has a uh, regime change every few years, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> that heavy metal, the heavy metal that I, I barely even knew still existed because uh, it's had so many, uh, you know, problems and changes over the years. Uh, yeah, I don't think they're in a position to be telling people to, uh, to to f off. You know, people paying customers who are uh, are critical. Now, I will say, I don't have a dog in this fight. I don't care that they put that character in armor, particularly. Uh, you know, it's it's fine as far as I'm concerned. If, if you don't like the, that they did that, just don't buy that comic with that character. Um, but their response to people saying, yeah, I don't really like this is just uh, unacceptable. And uh, it's, it's like, gonna, where do yes. they get off heavy metal magazine stepping up onto some sort of feminist tie horse calling other people man babies and, and toxic masculinity when like how many decades have you been publishing um tna books and now all of a sudden you want to tell other people that they're sexist because they they like tna like what you don't get to take that moral high point <laughs> well you know this is a new regime you know this is why you uh this is why you don't hire uh social media managers who hate your customer base you know, it's a terrible idea. I, I don't, the, the industry keeps doing this. They keep hiring people who don't like comics, don't like the fans, you know, who berate them and tell them that they're bad people and that they should uh, be in line with all these changes that are, you know, changing the medium to be uh, something more puritanical uh, that fits, uh, you know, with a, a more pro censorship kind of uh, mindset. And uh, when people uh, push back against that, they're told, uh, you know, well, why don't you F off? We don't want you anyway. And then when they go away, <laughs> then they, they cry that sales are down. You know, what, how, didn't we have a video from Kelly Sue DeConnick saying, if you don't like my politics, don't buy my books. And now she's talking about, oh, how do we save the Magic. industry? <laughs> 
<laughs> that's a, and I actually had a subscription to heavy metal for many years. It was during um, Kevin Eastman's um, run on, on it when he was the publisher of it. And he's not the publisher anymore, but I mean, it, it was a book. It was a magazine that I got every month and I would flip through it until I found a story that I liked and I would read it. And it was just, it was okay. But every single issue came in the mail with a, uh, a chick with a huge rack, barely, barely wearing any clothes, usually fighting, holding a sword or a gun or something and, and slaughtering monsters. And that's the image of what heavy metal magazine is. That's the image that it's had since the 1970s. I mean, even so that the character in question, her name is Tarna, and she's not even a character who originated from the Max Elf. She was created for the heavy metal animated film that uh, Ivan Reitman produced and directed back in the 80s. Um, and she was created as literally as a fill in character because they couldn't get the rights um, to Mobius's Arzak serial. So they created an Arzak esque um, original story for the movie and uh, filled in the character in armor in in like bikini armor you know who got naked and stuff but no one that that's heavy metal magazine that's what heavy, when heavy metal magazine creates a female character they create um a, a very yes the male gaze centric kind of character but that's heavy metal magazine that's their identity and that's been their identity for four decades they can't just suddenly out of the blue saying like oh i'm sorry do you not like that our characters um uh, are wearing full clothes well you can just you can get out of here you know you sexists you misogynists like we're a feminist book you know, and like since when and in a way heavy metal magazine was feminist because you know what tarna did in heavy metal she's cut people's heads off and she she kicked ass and she did it while wearing a bikini or sometimes nothing at all but that's the character now they can't just all of a sudden say that um oh you don't you don't like um our characters being fully clothed you, you think that we, sh we should have characters who are scantily clad well you're a sexist get out of here like you just that that's You've like been promoting Jimmy it for decades <laughs> it's, it's like whenever jimmy kimmel calls somebody else a racist like jimmy you wore blackface throughout the 90s, you know, multiple Make times. You don't get to oh, call no. other people a racist now. You don't get to stand on that that moral high ground. Heavy Metal Magazine, you spent 40 years with women barely wearing anything at all, most often nothing, uh, kicking ass. You can't call other people sexist because they say that they like women who are scantily clad. You don't get to we, be on that moral high ground. <laughs> you certainly can't push back against the fans of the magazine for 40 years or, or however mm -hmm. long when they say, hey, this isn't, the, this isn't what I buy this magazine for. Well, and tell them to F off and that you're not the kind of fans that we want and it's... It's hypocrisy, and you know it's. It, it, people can't ignore it. We can't pretend that your forty years of history don't exist just because all of a sudden now you're playing the virtue signal game. It doesn't work that way. Well, let me tell you yes. what the life cycle of heavy metal is going to be. It's going to be, uh, you know, they're they're going to ride this for a little while, and then it's going to be, oh, um, heavy metal is going through a uh, restructuring. Uh, some of our key people are are gone, and uh, you know there's some new people coming in. Then the next stage will be layoffs. Then they will get bought by somebody else. And then it'll finally culminate in the, you know, we uh, we regret to, you know, inform everybody that, you know, after so many years, we're ceasing publication. That's that's the way this is going. People say, what happened? How uh -huh. did this happen? Yeah, right. <laughs> it's a mystery. <laughs> Who could have seen this coming? <laughs> this is like when uh, when Vertigo folded and there were all those articles going like, well, you know, there was brand confusion and there was the market was just different. No, you told customers, you put out shitty books by uh, horrible creators uh, you know who you know who behave horribly, and uh, and then uh, you told people to f off, and then your brand died. That's what happened. You murdered it. <laughs> yeah, think about how many people lost their job because you told people to f off. Like it, it, it always affects more than just the the person that's putting the information out there. But I don't think every, everybody just lives in the moment right now, Aaron, and they just want to say what's ever on their mind, not thinking about the the full consequences of what could happen. Social media has made everybody believe that they are an important pundit about everything. And really, all that, uh, all that you are is the same decaying matter as everybody else. You're the same you know, person that you were before. Not that important in the grand scheme of things. <laughs> you know, but uh, because you got that, that Twitter platform, ooh, you think, uh, you think everybody needs to hear what you have to say at every single moment of the day. But it, it's crazy how not only creators like Neil Gaiman... But publishers like like heavy metal just, I guess if they change their mind, we're just supposed to forget about any of the history or any things that they've represented or, or said over the past. 
And uh, Mark, I'll let you let you kind of start wrapping this up, and we'll give Aaron the, the last word. I mean, I, I guess I've said everything I, I need to say. It, it's just like, how often, you know, does Justin Trudeau up there in Canada, the prime minister, just how often does he, you know, virtue signal and talk about racism and, and Black Lives Matter and all these things? And like, we can literally see photos of you wearing blackface, like not just one time, you know, only like that time that Ted Danson wore blackface at a, uh, at, a, at, a, at, a, at a Friars Club roast. No, like you did it repeatedly. This was something that you were fine with doing over and over again. And now you're standing on a, on a high horse like Jimmy Kimmel, just telling other people that, oh, you know, like this is racist. You're a racist. Don't be racist. Like you forfeit the opportunity to stand on that high ground when you do that. And heavy metal, you know, just even if heavy metal doesn't agree with, uh, these statements like, Hey, heavy metal magazine should be nothing but TNA. And frequently it was actually, it's almost like Playboy magazine when someone says like, Oh, I read it for the articles. Like that's bullshit. But yes, it does have good articles too. Um, heavy metal magazine. Yes. It's got a lot of TNA, but it also had some really good sci-fi in it. And a lot, a lot of, uh, really uh, intelligent science fiction stories too, but it also had chicks um, barely wearing any clothes. And that's usually what got uh, readers in the door. They can't pretend like all of a sudden they, that's never what they were and that they have to take, you know, clutch their pearls and be outraged at the idea that anybody would want to read a book with a scantily clad warrior woman in it. That's just like morally wrong. They're outraged. They can't they forfeited the the moral high ground to do that. Um, and Neil Gaiman, through all of the same thing to tie it together, like he can't pretend that uh, like anybody who, who says that a black woman shouldn't be cast as uh, um, Death of the Endless is a racist. Like you literally have a quote saying that this is what death is supposed to look like and no one should ever cast them as anything other than this um, Caucasian raven haired woman because that's who you base the character on. Like you forfeit the moral high ground to clutch your pearls and tell everybody that they're a racist when you literally have this quote saying the opposite. That the hypocrisy just is, you know, mind numbing. Death doesn't even have to be Caucasian. There are plenty of light skinned women that are from other races that you could cast in that role and you paint her, paint them white and, uh, you know, with the white, paint them <laughs> with the white skin, you know, because her skin is not Caucasian skin. Her skin is absolutely stark white it is uh you know and, and so you could paint anybody up in that and they would still look like death no matter what background they came from if you, you uh, she's know. a pa she's a pallid corpse because she's death she's supposed to look like a, co a corpse with no life in it that's that's the whole idea uh it i don't know it, it drives me nuts <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's like like you ask the pirate why does he have um, the steering wheel on his belt and he's like yar it drives me nuts yeah. <laughs> oh man uh, that is such a dad joke my dad is a <laughs> joke <laughs> but uh, yeah i think the problem with uh with this whole thing especially in the case of heavy metal is that you're absolutely right mark it was the, you know they used tna to get people through the door that's what they're known for and then you know there are some compelling stories inside you still see that same marketing approach with things like game of thrones Game of Thrones was basically that first season was basically a lot of softcore pornography, you know, and, and hopefully people stuck around for the story. And you kind of saw them move away from that later as people got more and more invested in the story. But when they didn't know that, uh, you know, whether or not it was going to be successful, they took the low road and threw in a lot of sex and nudity. And that's what heavy metal is. And, you know, you can try to rebrand it, but don't be surprised when people object and then don't tell them to go F off. Yeah. it's it's a really bad idea and just to, to bring it back around to neil gaiman you know he said uh you know just watch watch the show and find out uh after your rant neil i don't think i will be and I'm, i was a huge sandman fan but uh i, I don't have any interest in this iteration and uh, especially after uh after the way that you uh you talk to customers i'm not uh, i'm not interested thanks 